Is the full steel and wood M1A still a viable battle rifle in a world full of lightweight polymer and high-speed rails, or is its vaunted legacy nothing more than a revisionist fever dream? Stick around because I fired about 600 rounds through these guns like an asshole in a tank top and I have some thoughts about it. What is up guys, my name is John with PewPewTactical.com, your definitive source for gun reviews, gear guides, and all things that go bang. First things first, historical firearms are cool as hell, and there's nothing quite like holding, owning, or shooting a wood-clad gat that would have innumerable stories to tell if only it could speak. Now obviously the M1A is merely the civilian variant of the iconic M14, and the M14 itself was merely a modified M1 Garand that was developed post-World War II to fit the niche for a fully automatic battle rifle. While countries in the newly formed North Atlantic Treaty Organization definitely agreed that they should all standardize their small arms cartridges, there was a debate that ensued over what exactly that cartridge should be. While the British focused on a smaller 280 cartridge out of a concern for controllability in full auto, the US refused to adopt anything smaller than 30 caliber, citing concerns over diminished stopping power. Fast forward a bit past a lot of bureaucracy and a point where the US almost adopted the FNFAL, and we finally have NATO's adoption of the 7.62x51mm cartridge as its official battle rifle round. And with it, the US adopted the M14 in the late 50s. The M14, in theory, would simplify the makeup of weapons fielded by the standard American infantry squad. The leading brilliant minds of the time legitimately saw a future in which the M14 would replace the M3 grease gun and Thompson submachine guns, the BAR as a squad automatic weapon, the Springfield 1903 as a marksman rifle, and the M1 Garand and M1 carbine. A total overhaul of the ammunition and parts needed to keep a squad well supplied and operational. The gun was first fielded in Vietnam, and although 7.62 NATO proved great at punching through thick vegetation, the gun's overall length was poorly suited for jungle warfare. It was basically uncontrollable in full auto. Its wood stocks were subjected to swelling from jungle humidity, which affected zero, and a DoD report found that the rifle overall was inferior to both the M1 Garand it descended from and the soon-to-be-introduced M16. So where does that leave us? With an ensuing internet argument, of course. We'll just say this, the M14 and M1A have incredibly vocal supporters and detractors both, and if you have the misfortune of wading into the Mekong Delta of that online shit-flinging fest, it's probably going to be quite hard to discern how these guns actually perform in real life. Springfield Armory was kind enough to send us both a National Match M1A and a SOCOM 16 to try out for ourselves, and we hoped that by the end we'd have enough insight to give you a reasonable everyman's opinion, considering that you have folks claiming that these are sub-MOA guns at 1,000 yards with iron sights on one side of the debate, and some nerd that won't shut up about how the US should have adopted the FAL over the M14 on the other. The National Match M1A is, according to Springfield, hand-built to win competitions. The gun's action is glass-bedded into the walnut stock, which overcomes the traditional issue M14s face with poor fitment apparently affecting accuracy. The gun's also got a 5-pound two-stage trigger, which might feel sort of heavy, but it's real obvious when it's going to break and there's very minimal crap take-up. The SOC 16 is obviously a bit more compact and includes a 16-inch barrel and a black polymer stock with the iconic SOC 16 muzzle brake up front. The gun also has a Scout-style Picatinny mount just forward of the action, allowing for the addition of red dots or Scout scopes if that's your jam. First things first, in all honesty, these guns are quite dated in terms of design ergonomics. Again, they're civilian M14s, and even for the time, the M14 was quite dated with its traditional rifle layout as compared to the Soviet AK or the FNFAL. Considering you'll be rocking the ergonomics of an 80-some-odd-year-old rifle design, you can expect to feel out of place if you're the type of dude that's used to adjustable length of pull and a C-clamp style grip. The rifles are heavy and quite cumbersome, weighing in at 8 pounds for the SOC 16 and 10 pounds for the National Match, both unloaded and without optics. Because of the op-rod placement, you're likely going to have to jump your support handout way further than what feels natural if you're used to firing modern carbines. Otherwise, you'll be in for quite a shitty surprise when the gun bites you. However, the sling mount kind of gets in the way of what, for me, feels like a natural hand placement. And you've gotta kinda cup the gun to keep your fingers away from the op rod all the same. The M1A's safety is located within the trigger guard itself, and is essentially a metal tab that you press forward to disengage. Again, a bit of an antiquated design here. 
I don't particularly care for a safety mechanism that I have to get my finger near the trigger to operate. And the lever itself is quite stiff, kind of sketchy, and I prefer to use my left thumb to flick it forward. Both the M14 and the M1A are a little bit notorious for having a fulcrum point built into the design of the stock itself. Essentially what this means is that your dominant hand is going to sit in this swell and it's only going to increase the felt recoil when you fire it, as the muzzle is essentially going to use your dominant hand as an anchor point to go... It. Compare the design to an AR-15 whose recoil travels rearwards through the buffer tube the entire time and you can kind of understand what I'm getting at. I also find that for me personally, when I get down into a proper cheek weld with this gun, the way that you wrap your hand into this swell tends to pull facial hair out when you fire, and I fully understand that's a me problem, it's probably not a you problem, it's a me problem, it's fine. One thing I do like about both of these rifles is that the actions are incredibly crisp and smooth. When you're loading the gun from a bench rest position and you've got the bolt locked to the rear, all it takes to send it forward is just a tiny little bit of a pull, and you're good to go. If you've ever fired an M14 or an M1A, you will immediately understand why the full auto function of these rifles was restricted to semi very early on into them being fielded in the Vietnam War. I actually believe Gun Jesus himself has an excellent video demonstrating how uncontrollable this rifle is in full auto. Additionally, the mags are a little bit wonky to insert into the gun at first. You feel like you want to rock it in like an AK, and it's similar, but it's not quite the same. You've got to take this notch and kind of really drive it up into the receiver. You get it seated at kind of like a really wild angle like that, and then you push back, you'll start to feel it give, and then you go in until you hear that click. We're pretty used to it by now, and we've got the mags pretty broken in, but when these first came out of the bags they shipped in, they were really, really stiff, so just something to be aware of. So that about covers everything that we have to say about the externals of the rifle, but I'm sure you are probably here to know how they shoot. We took these guns out to the desert to ring some 200 yard steel, and in all honesty, the results were not fantastic. It seemed like no matter what type of 308 ammunition we used, from shitty PRVI to decent PMC to federal gold medal match, we'd hit one or two shots every three to four rounds using consistent holds on our steel target. Admittedly, we are not marksmen, but we all have a pretty decent amount of long range shooting experience, and our inability to hit reasonably close targets felt pretty damn wild. The M1A's most brutal critics online will tell you that the gun is just incapable of being accurized due to the design of the gun itself. This is not a free floated barrel, and the way that the action interplays with the stock, depending on the individual gun, can severely affect accuracy. There's also an infamous study on the M14 that essentially says the same thing, noting that the army came to the conclusion that the M24 was a much better marksman and sniper rifle than the accurized M14s that they spent several years and millions of dollars trying to create. However, that's for accurized marksman tier M14s, and I'm sure the army was totally capable of hitting 200 yard steel. So what's going on? Could it really be us? Maybe we don't understand the point of aim with M14 irons. Uh, to that point, are they that much different from the AR or the AK? Are we posers? Comment below if you think we're posers. We weren't sure, but we did find that both the National Match M1A and the SOC 16 performed about the same in this department, with the SOC 16's iron sights being a tiny bit worse considering that they're thicker and obscure most of the target at 200 yards. After a few mags, we decided to set up a shooting mat and rest to take some prone shots with an optic mount to the SOC 16 scout mount to see if the irons themselves were just inexplicably way off. Unfortunately, we still weren't getting great results, and the forward mounted Picatinny rail on the SOC 16 means that you are essentially relegated to scout scopes with good eye relief and not a whole lot more. Again, before the M14 defense squad shows up in the comments, we totally accept that we are not amazing shooters by any means, but this shouldn't be that hard, it really shouldn't be that hard. Considering the fact that it was 100 plus degrees on our shoot day and firing a shit ton of 308 on guns with meat tenderizers on their butt plates isn't the most pleasant thing in the world, we resigned ourselves to chill on the M1As and take them to a local range to shoot groups and get them dialed in. Fast forward to our next shoot day. This time we shot 100 yard groups with irons from the bench and the results are still pretty bizarre. One of the weirdest parts of the entire experience was the tendency for both guns to pull off consecutive rounds either through the same hole or touching one another, only for the next round to be a complete flyer somewhere else on the paper. Again, we're not so arrogant as to think that this couldn't be our fault, but 
how or why would we be able to put two rounds through the same hole to just completely fuck up the next shot and have it wind up inches away from a hundred yards from bench rest like it shouldn't be this hard. So this is maybe like a tiny bit of a peek behind the curtains for you all out there, but we don't like publishing just outright negative reviews when it feels like these things might be broken or there might be something wrong with them. So we reached out to Springfield to explain the problems we were having with these guns to them and see if they had any idea what might be going on. While they were alarmed at our results, they did offer to bring the guns back and test them at their facilities to see if there was maybe any reason that we received flawed rifles. Springfield's techs looked the guns over and purportedly found no issues with any of them. Springfield then mounted optics to the rifles using a 4th gen steel receiver mount and tested them thusly. The national match came in at 1.25 MOA with a Vortex 4-16x optic, and the Sox 16 shot 2 MOA with a Vortex 1-6, both at 100 yards. Again, this is obviously much better than the results we got the first two times we shot these guns. Do we suck? <laughs> Do we really suck that bad? What else could it be? Like, we're, we're blown away. What could it be? Comment below if you know what it be. Springfield offered to send the guns back to us for another round of testing, and we accepted. They even offered to include both the optics and the mounts to ensure that we'd be able to replicate their results. Fast forward to range trip number three, almost 900 rounds of 308 later, and we were finally able to get usable results out of these guns. Sweet Jesus, thank you. God, so much 308. With the Vortex optics mounted, we were now shooting about 1.5 MOA out of the National Match and about 2 MOA out of the SOC 16 using 168 grain gold metal Metal match ammo. Privy 145 and 180 grain out of the SOC 16 both still felt subpar, however, and PMC Bronze was decent but did have a flyer in the group you see on screen. The National Match didn't much like the Privy 145, but did okay with Privy 180, because literally nothing about any of this makes sense. PMC was okay, and Match was of course the best. We should note that if you are planning on using an optic on any of these rifles using the mount that Springfield sent us or any of the side mounting uh, mounts, you will want to invest in some sort of cheek riser as they do sit pretty high over the receiver and you're gonna hurt your neck. So the guns did okay with the addition of optics and shot pretty close to what Springfield told us they were getting out of them when they went back to the factory. But that kinda just makes the whole ordeal feel that much stranger. In all honesty, we still don't really know what to make of this entire experience. And like I mentioned previously, we really don't want to wind up accidentally summoning the M14 Defense Squad in the comments for even daring to suggest that maybe these guns are not the sniper tier weapons that our collective cultural memory has made them out to be. And if you want an example of what that looks like, go check out the comment section on the Gun Collective's M1A video and you'll know exactly what I mean. Again, for the umpteenth time, we're totally willing to accept that the problem may very well be us. <laughs> what sticks out as extremely odd for me personally, though, is that we've never had any sort of issues with any of our other 308 guns, and the inaccuracy occurred across multiple reasonably experienced shooters. It also seems unlikely that we would be able to get two rounds to touch on paper back to back multiple times throughout our shooting session if we weren't reasonably okay shots, only to have the subsequent shots fly off somewhere else completely different. And it just, just, it just none of it makes sense. It doesn't make sense. Springfield's lead tech also managed to shoot a 1.25 inch group with the national match using iron sights. Blaming the problem squarely on irons doesn't feel right either. Although it probably should be stated that the guy who is the lead tech at Springfield is the likely a goddamn pro at M1As, so we sort of deliberated on, on what sort of angle that we even wanted to take for this review because the results are so inconclusive. <laughs> it would have been really easy to just pretend that all of the weird accuracy stuff never happened, but that's really disingenuous and we try to be as real as possible with y'all, so shout out to everybody that continually calls us shills. See ya. We will say that Springfield's responsiveness in helping us sort through all of these issues was really nice, and we did want to share that experience with you all. We personally believe that if you were going to throw down this amount of cash on, on guns like this, having a manufacturer on the other side that does care and is going to get back to you and treat your concerns as valid, if you do have a problem, is excellent. But again, it feels 
really weird and, and honestly not even satisfying for us to present a gun review that is inconclusive. Are we just really bad with iron sights? Or did the guns get banged up in shipping? Or are the guns haunted? Or was Mercury in retrograde? We may never know. As for the rifles themselves, they certainly have their niche. Guns that are a nod to the past are definitely a blast to own and shoot, like I said. And if you're considering purchasing an M1A, we'd imagine it's likely because you have some sort of sentimental or historical interest in the rifle, not because you're trying to pick up something that is going to outperform an AR-10 variant. With all of that being said, the M1A is still a pretty cool rifle, and it obviously has ties back to the iconic M14 if that holds any sort of interest or value for you. If you're interested in picking one up, we'd honestly recommend trying to find a way to put some rounds to it beforehand just so that you know exactly what you're getting into. Alright guys, that's gonna do it for us today. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this content, please go ahead and subscribe to the channel as we've got lots more reviews of potentially haunted guns on the way. Once again, my name is John with PewPew Tactical, and we will see you next time. We'll do like a fast cut to be just- <laughs> ah!